Why do so many people go to such great lengths trying to deny a creator? Here's what Nancy damas Walgamuth says. If God is the creator of all of life, then he is also the sovereign ruler over all that he has created. And that includes us. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy damas Walgamuth, co-author of True Woman 101. For April 22nd, 2022, I'm Dana Gresh. What you believe about God matters for everything else in your life. Nancy will explain why as she continues in a series called Foundations of the True Woman Manifesto. It explores the True Woman Manifesto, which you can read at reviveourhearts.com. You'll find a link in the transcript of this program. If you missed the first couple of episodes of this series, you can find them there on our website too, or on the Revive Our Hearts app. The True Woman Manifesto, as we've said, has three main sections. The first section includes five foundational statements. What we believe. What we believe about God, about man, about sin, about salvation, and about God's redemptive plan for this world. And uh, you say, what does that have to do with being a true woman? Well, those statements are a backdrop for the rest of the document. They're foundational. We need to understand these things and agree on these things. Uh, If we don't agree on these things, then we're going to end up with a whole different set of conclusions and affirmations. And then we come to the second section, which is the affirmation section, where we highlight specific areas of truth that are vital for Christian women who desire to honor God with their lives. And then... I start to say the most important. They're all important. Uh, I can't have one section without the other. But we don't want to just know what's true. We want to come to that final section where we ask the question, so what? So all these things are true. What difference does that make in my life? What's, what's the practical outworking of all of this? And in that last section, there are 15, therefore, we will statements. Statements of consecration and commitment. By God's grace... By the power of his Holy Spirit, this is what we will do. This is how we will live out what we have said we believe. This is how we will live in light of what we believe. Now, today we want to look at the first of those five foundational we believe statements. This is a credo, a creed, I believe. This is what we stake our lives on, the truth of God's word. And the first of those five foundational statements is simply this. We believe that God is the sovereign Lord of the universe and the creator of life and that all created things exist for his pleasure and to bring him glory. And, oh, Father, as we open our hearts and our minds and our ears, I pray that you'd give us understanding. You'd give us hearts that say, yes, Lord, we agree with you about this. Help us to to see the importance of acknowledging you as the sovereign Lord of this universe and as the Lord of our lives. And may this truth, even this day, begin to penetrate and pierce our hearts and make a difference in every aspect of the way that we live. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In his classic book, The Knowledge of the Holy, which if you haven't read it, you must, uh, A.W. Tozer says this sentence, What comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let me say it again. What comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Do you agree with that? It's true. What we believe about God is foundational to everything else in the rest of our lives. And that's why this opening statement of the True Woman Manifesto deals with what we believe about God. And it affirms two things about God. There are a lot of things we could say about God, but this portion of the manifesto affirms two important things that both have monumental implications. First of all, that he is the creator of life, which means by implication, that we are not the creator, that we are the created. We are created beings. And then it affirms that he is the sovereign Lord of the universe. The implication of that is we are not sovereign. We are his subjects. He is the creator. We are the created. He is the sovereign. We are his subjects. Scripture affirms over and over and over and over again. Sometimes I like to just go through and count how many times the fact that God is the creator. 
It's important. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1, first verse of the Bible. First verse of the gospel of John. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Acts chapter 14, verse 15, Paul and Barnabas uh, challenged people to turn to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, you're probably aware that within our culture, particularly within the educational system and on other fronts as well, there is today massive, intense opposition to the concept of creation or God as creator. And you have to wonder why people are so intent on proving that God did not create all that we see around us. Well, the answer is simple. If God is the creator of all of life, then he is also the sovereign ruler over all that he has created. And that includes us. If there is a creator, if God is the creator, then he is the ruler, the sovereign Lord over our lives. And if he is not the creator, then we can be our own sovereigns. But you can't have it both ways. You can't have a creator God and us be sovereign. And that's why secular men and women who want to rule their own lives have got to try and prove that there is no God who is the creator. The fact that God is the creator means that he is the sovereign Lord. And the fact that he is the sovereign Lord means that he is God and we are not. It means that he has absolute right to determine our purpose, our design, and our calling as women. He has the absolute right to determine how we are to function in our relationships, in our homes, in marriage, in this culture. Now, the concept of a sovereign Lord is not exactly comfortable for us independent Americans. We are into democracy, Everybody votes. Representation. We had the American Revolution to counter the idea of a sovereign ruler who could tax us without us being represented. But the sovereignty of God is a precious truth and something that not only is true, but that we find great blessing as we embrace the fact that he is Lord of all. Another classic book by A.W. Pink is called The Sovereignty of God. And in chapter one, he asks this question, what do we mean by the sovereignty of God? We mean the supremacy of God, the kingship of God, the godhood of God. To say that God is sovereign, Pink says, is to declare that God is God. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the most high, doing according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, so that none can stay his hand or say to him, what doest thou? Daniel 4.35. He goes on to say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the almighty, the possessor of all power in heaven and earth, so that none can defeat his counsels, thwart his purpose, or resist his will. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the governor among the nations, Psalm twenty-two twenty-eight, setting up kingdoms, overthrowing empires, and determining the course of dynasties as pleases him best. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the only potentate, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Such is the God of the Bible. Let me give you another quote, this time by Pastor John Piper, who said in a sermon, the most fundamental thing we can say about God is that he is sovereign. So that is where I begin. I begin at the bottom, the root, the foundation of all we cherish, all the grace, all the love, all the patience, all the faithfulness, all the forgiveness, all the security and hope and peace and joy. All these things rest on the deep and glorious sovereignty of God. And then Dr. Piper goes on to say, if God is not sovereign, he is not God, and all our hope is dashed. Now, most of us theologically would agree that God is sovereign. But what are the implications of that? What does that mean? What difference does it make? Here's one implication. Because there is a sovereign, purposeful God It means that nothing in all of this universe happens by chance. That 
Everything in this world happens according to a wise, magnificent master design. Now, it's not hard for us to believe that about the good things that happen in our lives, but it can be challenging to believe that about the tough things that come into our lives. While I was working on this session, I got an email from a friend asking for prayer for their daughter who is 14 weeks into her second pregnancy and just found out yesterday that she has lost the baby that she was carrying. Less than a year ago, that same daughter gave birth to a little girl. And that baby was born with irreversible, permanent brain damage and lived just six days. Now, that's where the rubber meets the road on this whole thing of the sovereignty of God. Is this grieving young woman a victim of cruel chance? Or is her story part of a bigger, gracious, wise design that neither she nor we can see at this moment? Henry Drummond was a 19th century Scottish writer who writes about a children's book called The Chance World. Here's what Drummond says about that book. It described a world in which everything happened by chance. The sun might rise or it might not, or it might appear at any hour, or the moon might come up instead. When children were born, they might have one head or a dozen heads, and those heads might not be on their shoulders, there might be no shoulders, but arranged about the limbs. If one jumped up in the air in this chance world, it was impossible to predict whether he would ever come down again. That he came down yesterday was no guarantee that he would do it the second time. Today, a child's body might be so light that it was impossible for it to descend from its chair to the floor. But tomorrow, in attempting the experiment again, the impetus might drive it through a three-story house and dash it to pieces somewhere near the center of the earth. Drummond goes on to say, this chance world would become a lunatic world with a population of lunatics. Now, here's the good news. This is not a chance world. This is my father's world. As we read over and over again in the scripture, heaven rules. Heaven rules. And I want to tell you when everything in your world seems to be giving way, seems to be topsy-turvy, seems to be out of control. The fact on which you can stay your heart and your emotions and your mind and your life is this reality that heaven rules, that God is sovereign, that he is on his throne, that he has established laws of nature and sits as king and ruler over the universe. The book of Isaiah has this concept over and over and over again about the sovereign Lord. Read through that book and just revel in the encouragement that Isaiah gives to his readers in their day when the whole political system and the whole international system was so seemingly out of control. And again and again and again, Isaiah comes back to remind the people that heaven rules, that God is on his throne. It is he, Isaiah 40 says, who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness." This concept of the sovereignty of God and by implication the fact that we are not God and we are not sovereign but we are his humble subjects, it's illustrated I think so powerfully in the life of an Old Testament king whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a powerful king of Babylon. He was a proud man who thought that he, not God, was sovereign. But God humbled this proud king as he will humble anyone who is proud. God reduced Nebuchadnezzar to insanity, a lunatic, until Nebuchadnezzar could learn what every one of us has to learn, and that is that heaven rules. Let me read just one passage from Daniel chapter 4 where Nebuchadnezzar at the end of this experience gives his testimony. He makes a declaration, a manifesto about what he now believes about the sovereignty of God. He says at the end of the days, that is years where he lived as a madman because he had lost all his reason. And you do begin to live as a mad person if you forsake the concept of the sovereignty of God. 
He said, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. Now, let me just stop there. That's how you get your reason back. In a world that seems to have gone crazy, and sometimes you think you're going crazy, sometimes I think maybe I really am going crazy. How do you get your reason back? How do you get your bearings? How do you start to make sense of this nonsense world? You lift your eyes to heaven, and that's when you realize this is no chance world. I lifted my eyes to heaven, and I blessed the most high. There it is, the sovereignty of God. And what are we to do? Question him? No. Bless him? Yes. I blessed the most high. I praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. You'll see that statement throughout the book of Daniel. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Those words spoken in Daniel 4 by a man who thought that he had the ultimate dominion and kingdom, but he learned that his dominion, his kingdom were temporal, that only God, the Most High, has an eternal, everlasting dominion and kingdom. He goes on to say, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and God does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? You see, we don't have the right. We don't have the ability to stay the hand of God, to stop the hand of God, to challenge, to question his reasoning, his decisions, his will. He is Lord. He is sovereign. He is most high. Now, here's another implication of the sovereignty of God. Because there is a sovereign, purposeful God, that means that our lives are not meaningless specks in a chance world. Rather, our lives are part of a grand design, and they have purpose and significance. As the sovereign Lord and the creator of life, God is the one who defines our reason for existing. He's the one who determines what is our purpose in this world. It's the ownership principle. He made us. He owns us. He's sovereign over us. And he determines what is our purpose and our significance in this world. That which was created by him was created for him. And that's what our purpose is. As this first statement of the True Woman Manifesto affirms, we believe that God is the sovereign Lord of the universe and the creator of life and that all created things exist for his pleasure and to bring him glory. You see this theme of our created purpose, created by him and for him, again, through all the scripture. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, created by him, created for him. Colossians 1, verse 16, for by him, all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, as you listen to that verse, think about the fact that you were created through him and for him. But when it talks about all thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities, do you realize they were all created by him and for his purposes? You say, including wicked kings? Yes. Including wicked leaders of nations or businesses or industries? Yes. They were created by God and for him, whether they realize and acknowledge it or not. Romans 11, verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things, all things, all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That's why we were created. We exist to bring him glory. And that is God's goal in this world, that all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And our lives exist to fulfill God's purpose here on this earth. That is to bring him glory. That gives our life significance and purpose and meaning. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, Revelation says, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and for your pleasure they exist and were created. 
Ephesians chapter 1, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Ladies, we need to remind ourselves of this every morning when we, before we get out of bed and every night before we go to sleep and all throughout the day that God is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He's the creator of life and that we are created beings who are his subjects and that we exist for his pleasure and to bring him glory. That needs to be the grid through which we evaluate everything that happens in our day, everything that happens in my life. Not does this bring me pleasure, But does this bring God pleasure? Not does this make me look good, but does this make God look good? If the glory of God is our supreme passion, that defines our goals, our objectives, how we go about reaching those goals, how we spend our time, everything about us. It's all about Him and not about us. In fact, I found myself not too long ago journaling about this very thought when I was in the middle of a circumstance that was sending me into a tizzy. And I had to sit down and do what I tell other women to do, and that is counsel your heart according to the truth of God's word. Because if we don't counsel our hearts according to the truth of God's word, we lose our bearings. We get emotionally out of control. We get mentally out of control. We get discombobulated. We start to live as if this were a chance world. And that's why we need to sit down and remind ourselves, speak to ourselves and tell ourselves the truth. And here's what I told myself as I wrote it in my journal not too long ago. If I fixate on how all this affects me, my comforts, my desires, my fulfillment, my security, my needs, then I have made self, me, an idol. This is not about me. It is about denying self. And crowning Christ as Lord and seeking his glory and pleasure above all else. And you know, as I began to speak that truth to myself, I found the peace of God, the settledness, the assurance, the stability coming and taking over what had been this kind of eruption going on within my emotions and my mind. This is a stabilizing truth. This is what keeps us sane is knowing it's not a chance world of lunatics, that it's a world that lives under the sovereign hand and control of God Almighty. And so what do we do? We worship him as the sovereign Lord. We give him honor and glory and praise. How well are you fulfilling his purpose for your life? Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth has been confronting us with a simple yet powerful truth. God is the creator. Acknowledging that fact will have a huge effect on your life. That's why the True Woman Manifesto begins with God is creator. As we mentioned earlier in the series, the True Woman Manifesto was introduced at the first True Woman Conference in 2008. Since then, we've seen God work in incredible ways in the lives of women through these conferences. And I want to let you know that the next conference, True Woman 22, is coming up this fall, September 22nd through 24th. The theme of this conference is Heaven Rules, and we'll be hosting it live in Indianapolis as well as online. You'll hear from speakers like Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, Mary Cassian, Kay Arthur, Chris Brooks, Karen Ellis, and more. Plus, I'll be there too. We'll be looking at how we can have courage and comfort no matter what we face because God is in control. Heaven rules. If you're thinking about signing up, don't miss the early registration deadline. Sign up before May 1st to get the lowest rate on your registration. You can register and find out all the details at reviveourhearts.com or just give us a call at 1-800-569-5959. Again, it's one 800 569-5959. I hope we'll see you there. Today, Nancy described God as the creator. Next week, we'll explore why he created male and female. Join us again next time for Revive Our Hearts.
Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth wants to help you discover greater freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.